start shortly. The recording is starting in a few minutes. Uh, yeah, there you go. The recording has started. Chantal, take okay. it away. Thank you. Uh, hello, hello, welcome. Welcome to a monthly Elixir webinar sponsored by Elixir Kenya. I'm super excited to have you here, excited about all the amazing conversations that we're going to have today. Uh, now, before we begin, let me remind you one thing. We will be recording today's session for those who are unfortunately not able to make it here today. We will also kindly require you to mute your mic and turn off your video to avoid unnecessary interruption during the session. But be free to ask questions on our Slido platform, which will be provided to you on the chat, or you can type a question on the chat. So joining us today is a remarkable and amazing visionary. When I say I mean I'm sorry, when I say amazing, I mean it. What's special about him is that he loves helping young adults just like you build their programming skills. So today he will illuminate the best practices of REST API for the next six, 60 minutes, handing us lots of practical ideas you can immediately put to work when you're back in the office on Monday. Let's welcome Chris Nyaga. Chris, it's so good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Chris, Hello. you can take it off. Um, just to confirm, you can hear me clearly. Yes, yeah, you're loud and clear, yeah. Chris. Awesome. Um, I'll take care of my environment in case it does get noisy, but uh, thanks for the intro, uh, Chantel. This is my first time presenting to Elixir Kenya, um, and I'm excited, but I have attended some of the previous sessions. Um, as introduced, I am Chris. I am based in Nairobi. I am a... Uh, full stack, but mostly backend developer, full stack developer who doesn't write CSS. So <laughs> there are many of us. Um, yeah, a little about myself is I've been an engineer for about six years now ish, give or take. Um, had an interesting run so far, uh, working with different type, different programming languages. My current focus for about the last six ish months has been Ruby and very need deep in Ruby. So I opted not to make this a very elixir recession. Um, for the people in the WhatsApp group, I earlier on sent a message saying, don't expect to sell in your a lot of elixir code in the session because I myself feel like I'm out of my zone with elixir. <laughs> uh, but again, I'm excited to be with you guys. Um, yeah, so I will share my screen in a few. Uh, what else can I send? Yeah, I work um, again in Nairobi. Um, I work for which companies? So now I work for like two to three companies. Uh, one very local, nice company called Quara. So if you're ever interested in, um, or you've ever heard of a company called Quara, they do microfinance software for circles. It's a web, um, a nice SaaS startup and hiring so definitely do reach out after if you're like a ruby dev who's interested in that opportunity i also work with andela i've been at andela for about two years and right now i've been working with github um, as a ruby developer so that's an interesting team um, definitely learning a lot from that end as well so this session will be a rant slash discussion about stuff rest about restful stuff um if you do have any questions, hopefully you'll get time for this at the end. I'll try to in, like uh, speed through while giving content because the list of slides is slightly longish, but because um, it's a, it's, there's a lot of broad concepts and the idea is we can run all day about API design. It's, it's a never ending topic. Um, some communication info for myself at the bottom there. Find me on GitHub at Big Zoo. There's not much there. But if you want to chat, I am available on Twitter at underscore Big Zoo and the email that's there or in the WhatsApp group. So uh, I will be available to discuss. So first, um, the assumption for this top for the session is we have some sort of an understanding of what REST refers to, uh, of what APIs are, of how programming works, and 
I would I think the balance or the demographic in this session is some guys who are learning and some very senior guys, um, or even good friends of mine I've seen on this call. So if BX, I would expect to mess some things up in between, or if I do say something that's not clear, just note it down and then you can ask it later. We can discuss it in the group later. So I will go through the slides. So some of the broad concepts in REST, the concepts or things that do come up when you're thinking about designing APIs. Um, we have client server, how does your, how do your clients interact with your server? Yeah. Both both sides, like it's a client and servers or servers and client, servers and clients. Statelessness and how um, state is persisted, handled, transferred in different parts of your system. Cacheability, I'm not sure if that's an actual word, but then it's just based on um, what kind of strategies are you considering or do you have in place um, for caching your data? Um, your interface, layered system, code on demand. It's a long list. Um, we won't cover the entire list of things, but then we'll be discussing things. Um, the ones that are on the slide there. If you do have an important question about a specific part, I don't know about the moderator, but I'm okay with anyone jumping in with a quick question. So architectural constraints um, becoming traits. So this slide is just talking about, um, or just trying to say that in REST, like design, there, there always will be architectural constraints as with basic any, any form of basic design. This is like beyond tech. When you're designing your APIs, um, things constraints become things like um, the choice of stack or tooling that you have access to, um, language, um, the kind of infrastructure that you expect your code to run on, um, and that form of list. And what this is just trying to say is those become a heavy part of the traits in which your, the traits that your system will have in the end because the constraints you have lead you to make a certain set of decisions and those decisions end up becoming the specific traits of your system and have an impact in how you can do certain things within your design, which is basically evolve your APIs, how you can scale your APIs, build a lot of security specific features, fault tolerance, um, uh, limitation, access limitation. Uh, again, it's a long list of things. So evolvability, this is while you design or while you are designing an API, how do you consider the future of an API in terms of the current decisions you make right now? How would they um, place themselves or in what position do they remain as your system is evolving, um, both from an engineering perspective and from uh, from a product perspective? Because uh, again, you are building a product for a certain um, set of users. so. Some of the things to be considered in this scenario, we'll talk about context, um, abstraction, and maybe how capital may be handled. So in this, we have a, a small illustration of how a lot of systems look like. So we have a client, which can be a browser. We have uh, an application that may be accessing a database and then some form of business logic uh, that is related to this. And then things like CRUD, which basically is how you implement your layer uh, or your API layer. Uh, how the communication is handled in between the client and the server. Um, and that's where REST literally comes in, right? So uh, very similar logic. And here, just trying to dig a little deeper, the kind of stack or what we said, um, architectural decisions, which become your um, traits, the traits of your system. So in your browser, again, some JavaScript code. Uh, in your application, whichever uh, backend thing you write, could be some nice, some nice fancy looking Elixir, could be some Java, PHP, I digress. So again, this slide is full of a, a long list of opinions and I hope um, they make sense. It's not like you don't move business logic to the client to replicate into it. Um, the, the statement is trying to um, put you in the direction of while you're designing your API, you're designing it for consumption uh, for a set of clients in some um, business context. Something that uh, in without making the right design, design decisions, you can easily end up realizing you have a lot of duplication 
or you you don't have um, ideal decoupling of components of your system because of how your client and server are designed. So there is, to some extent, um, an influence, uh, the influence that a client can have in how you're designing the system, but then it's not a final, so the final direction in which the system, um, the direction of the system, so a final decision maker uh, in which direction the system goes or in which direction your API goes, how your interfaces look like, whatever kind of information you're exposing. Um, and again, this is, we're gonna be discussing this the entire time. So you don't move your business logic. In this scenario, business logic um, is very, is, is again, this is specific or in respect to your product um, and your clients. In this scenario, we can just talk about a web app. So by meaning that you replicate into it, it means uh, designing a set of abstractions. And this is not really code. This is kind of like documenting um, the entities or resources that are across uh, that exist across these different boundaries. When you have um, best case scenario, we find not even best case. In some scenarios, we find some people writing backends in JavaScript and their frontend in JavaScript. Um, it leaves them in a nice place where their code can actually contain uh, interfaces that can be applied in both in both their client side and server side that would allow them to easily replicate some form of logic into them. Um, and in some scenarios when you don't have the same luxury, then it, it's, it's a gray area, it's a gray line in between how much business logic should be owned by your server versus how much should be owned by your client. Um, my opinion, or at least as far my experience so far in this is, there's no perfect answers to many things in tech, but by replicating your logic, it means from the client's perspective, um, serving its purpose, requires that it should entail a required set of validations, a required set of specifications. Um, if we have our uh, boundaries documented um, somewhere, which is like the shared resources or entities within our system, our, our overall architecture, then we can translate that into code and basically uh, guard against or build for the same the levels of validation um, data like data modeling and um, abstraction that would look very similar in different sides of our system. So that's basically saying we can replicate logic in this different, um, uh, uh, what, what do we call them, applications. And that is, it helps you create uniformity or align, uh, like have a design language that is uniform while you're, or across your boundaries. So if we have a REST API, for example, then it means with some set of agreed upon uh, data model, then an implementation of that model is easily applicable to whatever interface of choice you implement. For example, REST APIs, um, and they're able to communicate as ideally. Um, yeah, I will try to speak faster because it will make more sense. Um, Again, in this scenario, we have more clients, and this is where we realize uh, we have mobile clients, so we can have a mobile app that is um, one of the uh, applications using our API. And we have the same concern where, again, these are shared areas of concern, especially from the client's perspective, and the shared model would be relevant to each of the different clients because you're representing data that fits within the same graph. And that's why once we have some form of modeling in place and we implement that in all the different um, applications, AKA, um, what did we call it here? Uh, replicating, replicating our business logic in the different areas, then we see how that uh, allows us to speak one language, which is across the different areas. Um, we continue along the same lines, front-end versus back-end services. Um, it starts small, where you have a single service, a single client, um, of concern from your backend and everything. And slowly we end up with scenarios like this. Uh, we have different services dependent or even deployed separately, used for different um, things by our customers or consumers. Um, some of them, depending on the company, are internal tooling that depend on the same data model, uh, multiple clients, um, the list is endless. So while you're designing, um, and this is why like API design is an entire conversation, 
what are the things to keep in mind to just have some form of harmonious documented approach to the whole world of API design. Um, I'm guessing a few of you or maybe most of you may be familiar with um, what like microservice design pattern. Uh, how some people do, what do we call these things? Uh, uh, let me try to remember lambdas. We call them like things like a WS lambda where you just have like functions, um, things things like Firebase functions. Um, we have again the basic monolith architecture where you just want your things inside. The more not as commonly spoken of service oriented architecture. And there's a long list of differently named design patterns of like how to put your things in order. And some of them you'd find the same thing referring to different patterns. Someone would call service oriented architecture say and define it as something, something and define it as how someone else would define microservices. So I think it doesn't really matter what you call it, right? Uh, when you sit down and look at the system, when you analyze your requirements, with your evolving requirements, um, then you can you kind of get to a place where you can make more informed decisions about this. So uh, the next slide here, we say, the less your systems and teams have to talk to each other, the more independently they can evolve. Um, this is a principle that tries to say that uh, in mo whenever, especially your data layer can be siloed in areas of concern where you don't really have an architecture design where you're forcing or where you you're forced to create um, communication um, like paths in between very small layers or areas that have been abstracted independently so for example you're building a um, the world famous blog uh, blog and we have things like blog posts we have comments i'm trying to think of what would be a really really uh, interesting instruction so for example you have your users and your posts if for some reason someone advised you to build this in microservices and you decided that you're going to have a microservice for your users microservice for your posts microservice for your comments so it can work for sure, like that's in you. If you if you can write the code, then it will run. Um, but then the question that is begged, or this begs the question of um, should you? And it, as you build this thing or this idea that can be a simple um, implementation, you're forced to adhere to this set of decisions that you made earlier on, where to implement or to make a small step in your system, you have to hit different data points. And we hear things like RPC design coming into conversation. Um, these are like making procedural calls. And there are a lot of protocols written around how to do things like this. You'd hear some people mention um, messaging and queuing services, where they're now considering bringing RabbitMQ into their blog post service so that they can publish and subscribe to topics. So there's a new post that needs to be associated with a certain other thing. So the point of this is saying, of, I, I think there's an up there building a blog with microservices, but then the idea is in your area of concern, in your business, in the company that you work with, when you design the different components of your system, um, especially when you are aware that there will, that it, it is required to have some level of communication or data moving, data flow within the different um, parts of uh, concern for a certain maybe business area then be very aware that the more abstractions you may try to create around your design, around your APIs, um, can create a certain sense of complexity that makes it hard for you to evolve the different parts of the system. In, for example, if you make a push in one service, then I've, I've, and I've, and I've seen this in teams where just to fix a bug, we have to like merge PRs in five different repositories just because of the way our systems are decoupled. And in, in one, especially from a user's perspective, which, is, which helps a lot um, to know whether you're going on the right track, then you, if you have ever found yourself where one area of concern from a user that feels like it's just one domain, but then in your architecture and uh, like in your architecture implementation hits like four or a, a number of different um, levels of abstraction, which all like needs to communicate with each other to achieve this same simple thing that the user needs updated, then you kind of realize 
are there ways in which you can improve this? It's it's not that every system that works like that needs a change, but then you still you have to maintain a balance of um, developer experience, uh, evolvability, and again thinking of the future whereby if you keep on building features on top of this, then it's it becomes a recursive scenario where out of each of these specific boundaries, other boundaries can be created and the level of complexity just keeps on getting deeper and deeper. Um, API, evol API evolvability is key in a system of systems. Um, said system a bunch of times on this call. Um, but then in the word, the term itself is as different people understand it differently. Um, a quote, uh, or there's a book, uh, yeah, I'll try the slides later, but then uh, some slides just reference books in which they try to, different authors try to bring different perspectives into how you can consider um, system interfaces and, and API uh, layer abstractions. So long runs around evolvability. Um, the takeaway from this is as you design your boundaries, keep in mind how these boundaries may evolve around each other. As you create or remove levels of abstraction, um, how does this look like um, when someone wants to now evolve this thing or when this area of product evolves um, or when this, uh, from an engineering perspective, once you get to a place where you want to break off your system into different places for purposes such as scaling or um, architecture rewrites, then how does the current interface look like um, that's up to support that future in mind? Um, you're not by shedding over our future. And I, the, there's a Yagni principle of you ain't gonna need it. And that still applies to some extent, but that it, it also means that while you're designing, you don't just build um, for the sake of everything right now. You keep in mind the future and and taking into account this, this can just be something like documentation, having a clean interface, um, having, and again, interfaces are key in evolvability. That's something that, I also come came to realize because it means that especially when you are updating your abstractions or when you are doing your abstractions, the first thing, if it wasn't done previously, is to create some, some form of interface where you can um, predict or where you can adapt or create multiple adapters that can implement um, the requirements that you need. And in a future where you are breaking off different parts of your system, then that interface is what will allow compatibility um for the future so evolving distributing distributed systems um i'll put a link to that so when we talk about clients and servers um are you in charge of the client um yes and no it depends in some scenarios you are building um clients for uh you're building api clients for like a, a human client for like a customer so that means you're in luck and in some scenarios you are definitely hired to just build an api to implement some form of um, uh, interface that will be used by other people. So these are interesting questions, right? Are you in charge of the client releases? Um, are you in charge of the client deployments? Do you know your clients? Um, I These questions are here to, again, talk about the kind of influence a client can have in um, the way you design some of your interfaces or the things you keep in mind while you're designing your REST APIs. Um, Versioning is something that uh, can be done in, in a lot of ways, but then if your clients specifically need to, uh, or are 24, at, at any point in time using your APIs, you can't just break specific interfaces over like better implemented like endpoints and expect um, that your clients are able to keep up with it. So this means that while you are designing, um, building with a sense of how do you support clients that um, either you do have access to or you do not have access to. Um, is the engineering team able to keep up with the pace of how you're designing this? If not, then how do you ensure that the code you're pushing, um, even to replace legacy abstractions, can coexist for a certain point in time up until you are safe to say that we can get rid of previous um, uh, properties of how our interface look like? Our, of our interface uh, or, or, or of our API and then replace them with whatever the client is using as an upgraded version. And 
again, as you work with your clients, then how do they, how, how are they kept aware of these updates? Um, and some of, some of the things I mentioned later in the slides. So do you want to know your clients is a last still big one, which is even in scenarios where you're not, you're not exactly in control of who or when is building the consumers of your APIs, um, do you, is making a concerted effort or some level of effort to understand the people who are building this going to aid in how you design this? Um, my argument for this is yes, because once you have the kind the perspective of an actual consumer, then you can, uh, some things that may easily not be in mind usually come into play. It's, it's kind of like having code in front of your eyes for an entire day. And then just someone sees it for five seconds and they're like, you know, this could actually be this because it feels um, better like this or it makes more sense depending on how our interface looks like. And it kind of pushes you into the domain of collaboration where you realize um, having more eyes in to what you're doing can be very helpful in how you design um, your interfaces. Levels of abstraction. Um, in here we say elevating an API abstraction uh, level to HTTP ads cost. Um, this statement or what does elevating API abstraction to HTTP mean? Um, REST by itself is, is like representational state transfer represented by a set of um, verbs and uh, that like convey a certain intention where we have get post stuff like that. When we get into things like uh, damn, I can't, can't remember that name. Or when you're building RPC kind of specific APIs, you find having, you're not really um, respecting verbs, or I'm guessing many of you or some of you may have seen APIs that aren't really respecting or following the pattern of, say, like if we are baiting, let's do a put. Um, probably all had to do some form of update or post requests or some form of deleting resources of uh, again post requests or even get requests if you are lucky or unlucky. And the idea behind this is um, in scenarios uh, where you are abstracting or you're elevating uh, business logic or business concerns um, into your API level and encoding them into how your interface looks like rather than following a set of predictable design patterns which is as simple as what REST dictates, then this is adding cost to your um, API or to the future API that you're proposing to be built in a certain way. The reason for this is just because of one, the level of maintenance of something that isn't really following a structured pattern isn't as, isn't as good as like the alternative. When you have more engineers joining your team, when you're adding more, um, areas of concern into your system as you add more features over a lack of over an unstandardized scenario then then you're just in a rabbit hole of um, getting deeper and deeper into unpredictable territory uh, when you do want to standardize and do extra things like document um, document your apis um, expose your apis to multiple parties get maybe other engineers to help into um, and maybe even in some scenarios, break off into multiple teams to handle multiple areas of concern, even within one monolith, um, without having that uh, like same set of shared understanding of how you're going to design your interfaces and not really bringing abstraction to the HTTP layer, but following the rules of how RESTful design should look like and implementing your business logic within those constraints, then um, the former leads you into a more costlier approach. So I have a question. Can you guys hear Slack notifications? Is it just, is it my laptop? Can anyone answer that? Can, can anyone hear Slack notifications from my end? I want to know if I should switch off Slack because I can hear them. Yeah. Oh. I'll take that as a no. Um, cool. No. So the next thing is here, what are the benefits? What are the benefits you get for that cost? So this is like while you are um, elevating levels of abstraction to different layers of your API. Ironically, the more generic your API, the more coupling you create. 
um, generic is in generic is used in this scenario to refer to not as tied to your area or business domain or area of domain and um, yeah and and just trying to maintain the smallest level of uh, the smallest level of elevation of like these forms of or business concerns into your actual uh, like API encoding or endpoint design or for you like just abstract uh, then the more coupling you create. Coupling in this, like it's trying to show that if you, if you again, just follow a strict no, no implementation pattern or a strict generic pattern, then you, you end up having a lot of uh, specific or small bits of the system or small um, interfaces within your system that all, that all are very, are expected to do a, a very small set of um, a small set of in, uh, changes or information or logic, and then the coupling areas to get or to communicate a certain business um, uh, logic where you're just trying to create a post. And we talked about creating a post, having to hit maybe multiple microservices based on just where the user information is stored, where your post where your post information is stored, where you're maybe you're tracking your uh, user information, so your viewership information, how many people are seeing this, what are the statistics around it, and having a bunch of those things in very, or like uh, owned by very small parts of the system that just try to communicate over multiple um, uh, interfaces can like leave you in a state of uh, a lot of things just being coupled together. So how do you kind of um, have a sweet spot? What's the sweet spot in between? So again, here we say business logic is replicated into and amongst clients, which create coupling. Here we have presentation process flow, domain logic, and data. Um, I'm gonna try to go in faster as we try and see what coupling means in this sense and like um, how do we make sense of this. Um, contracts, right? Uh, probably a lot of us have heard about them. And what what do contracts mean? I'll introduce a, a conascent. Um, and what this is a quote um, from Wikipedia saying, in software engineering, two components are conascent if a change in one would require the other to be modified in order to maintain the overall correctness of the system. Stronger forms of conascence are acceptable if the elements involved are closely related. Um, so this is kind of like, as you, how do you implement coupling in a state is like in a position or in a form that allows your system to evolve um, while also maintaining a set, uh, like some sane level of complexity that makes sense um, where you don't have your business logic encoded into your HTTP uh, design or how you're implementing the different forms of uh, REST uh, principles while you're also having an acceptable level of connaissance where a small um, area of concern to be uh, collated and like have like collected in a certain area of the system where it doesn't actually affect multiple um, uh, abstractions of business logic because you have an actual interface or so the idea is once we have a lot of the business domain or business specific decision decision logic with uh, behind contracts or behind um, abstractions that give us interfaces where we're just able to communicate a very small subset of expected actions. And as early on as possible, uh, I found that when you're designing these forms of contracts, then not entirely keeping in mind the current client requirements, but then of thinking overall, um, and, which, and this is when we bring in uh, evolvability, thinking about what would this client um, look like or what are its concerns from a broader perspective rather than just in respect to this feature that I'm trying to implement. And then having all that encoded within uh, business logic abstractions means even as your API evolves, the same layer of abstraction can be used in different implementation areas or areas of concern where you don't have to go tweaking around your uh, domain abstractions because your interfaces already expose all the different things that are relevant to that area of the system. Um, stronger forms of connaissance are acceptable if the elements involved are closely related. There are, of course, scenarios where we do now have ideally separated um, areas of business concern or areas of 
business logic abstractions. And this is just what this um, statement is trying to champion. That that will that will happen. Don't expect it not to happen and don't force your system to be decoupled in a way that you don't you just don't want um, side effects, but then have a good balance of side effects and um, separation of concerns for the different uh, areas of business logic and interfaces that expose actions on on this um, areas of business. The same strength of the same strength and degree of connaissance will have a high difficulty and cost of change. The more distant the uh, involved elements are, um, kind of already um, talked around this a bit, which is just that um, you do not want the cost of change to be insane. You want it to make sense based on um, the requirements that you have and the kind of uh, business logic you're trying to put behind those levels of abstraction. Um, such that that level of connaissance or how often do you end up having to tweak, update, work within or work without your interfaces is uh, an acceptable level of difficulty and complexity. Uh, jumping right into a different side of these things, which is like versioning. So a bunch of different fundamentals that we are coming across. Um, OK. Um, a programmer had a thought, had a problem. They thought, I'll just use versions. Now they had a problem, um, 1.0, problem 2.0, problem 2.1. Versioning is no easy feat, as many who may have tried may have realized. Um, and I think versioning is one thing that does not have as much standardization into how we approach, um, how it is approached in terms of API design and just in broad um, software implementation, um, because different um, systems end up creating different rules of how to access um, different versioning strategies and also engineers themselves while building for versioning or while um, say for example bumping up their versioning to solve a newer set of requirements a new understanding of uh, client and usability a new uh, understanding of skill and necessities of uh, like we have a certain set of business requirements to meet while also meeting a certain set of performance requirements um, client um, formats that they should be supporting and it's a long list of things so what do developers do like some guys are like use a different endpoint um, others would be like use a different accept header others uh, you'd end up finding different api versions even um, like having uh, accepting different content types which is all acceptable uh, to a certain degree but then the idea for this is it's not an easy challenge. Um, a quote or a tweet from some uh, API developer like us on Twitter uh, says, no versioning an API is not evolving an API. You build separate services, that's all. Um, and this kind of brings a perspective of a service in this context. So the way I would understand it is how, like the, the interface that you expose to access your information and it should feel less of an evolve of your API and more of like building a new service, right? Uh, implementation, this ends up becoming evolving an API because a lot of people build upgraded versions of their interfaces strictly tied or related to the earlier versions of where they began. They start by looking at what they were exposing before and then try and say, now this can be moved to this or we can create we can split this information up into multiple endpoints. We can come, come, we've come up with new um, data domains that we want to encode in our API that we previously didn't have or didn't take into account. Um, and again, it, it works, but then it kind of also leaves you kind of where you started. And that's my argument. If that's the only perspective you come in while you're trying to improve versioning schemes for your service. Um, this is an extract from a book, uh, still talking about versioning. Um, this is where we have not point to point compatible. Explaining this is, so the idea behind this is we have versions and then we have a certain set of data points. Um, what we have at the top is at this point, the cost becomes unbearable and every change in services becomes tactical. Uh, this is not the best example, but it's a good, uh, extract from this book. I wanted to plug this in here. So I'll put this in the subtext. It's a, a scenario from the author. But then 
the cost of versioning an API um, in this, uh, and I look, Ooh, I didn't put the next slide here. Um, the, out, the takeaway from myself in terms of how you're considering versioning uh, for APIs is mostly captured by kind of the truth we were discussing. Imagine your services or imagine newer versions of your interfaces as new, entirely new services and an opportunity to build from the ground up. If possible, an opportunity to not to have it as 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 uh, less as less coupled to earlier versions as possible. Um, if the, the domain models aren't as specific, or they should only match the previous models from a business perspective, if if it, if like it's that much required. Um, and again, that will happen in a lot of design. When you're building a new API, it doesn't mean your business has changed. It doesn't mean all the things that you did in API version one were wrong or version two. But then my my point with this is building. Don't don't try. Don't don't think too much about V1 and improving V1. Think about a new chance to create a better version, a, a better implementation. So this is basically like. Uh, New, new. You had one robot that kind of served its purpose with a set of patches. So try and think like you're building from the ground up. Some core concepts will remain the same in terms of the core parts of your, say for example, your graph, your data modeling, um, where your data is coming from, the type of users you have. But as you design your API, which is the focus of like this point, then what interfaces make sense right now? Does it still make sense to use? Um, a certain set of standardized, um, like, uh, does it still make sense to expose this in JSON? Um, you may have realized, uh, like in REST API, you end up having, especially when you're trying to handle things like resources, a bunch of nested endpoints, and your clients may be in a state where they're making a bunch of different requests just to achieve a certain um, set of requirements. And that, is it, does it make sense to consider other approaches as to how you model your data from that perspective? So while you version your API, yes, you can always, it doesn't really matter what your versioning strategies are in my perspective, like whether you're versioning via a new endpoint, whether you're gonna do service and just make it look like it's old service or whether you're going to use things like accept headers to make it easier for your users to migrate to your newer API um, endpoint by endpoint. The core, the core part of your design should be um, the evolving requirements of how your previous, your previously existing API has performed, has lived, and has been used. So, yeah. Uh, lastly, internationalization um, is a big one, and <laughs> this makes a lot of engineers just flip their desks. I don't know about, I don't know if there are people here who have gotten a request like. It's we want to add a new language and you realize you have encoded strings, wordings, information in 101 different places. Um, internationalization is one of the simplest things to uh, uh, make a core part of your system from the get go because it makes you follow a certain standard that's not really that complex to understand, implement, and doesn't really, um, and has a net, amazing net positive impact for your system as it evolves uh, because one you always have one point of reference as to how you declare your labels and it makes it easier to maintain even without going to a place where you now have requirements that now uh, across different domains like different countries and stuff like that and um, it becomes relevant to actually implement it so when the time comes always keep some of these things in mind if you're at the early stages of designing your apis or your products or your stuff then consider things like this um, because if the product kicks off and becomes an insane thing, then uh, it's hard to keep track of that sort of thing. Um, I, think, I think I missed a slide here in the conversion. Uh, this was a dive into like uh, a use case as we discussed, like this is say for example, um, a restaurant's API and how you implement like a lot of different things for how you would order something like coffee um, how do you implement payment within your APIs and how do you encode things like uh, basically business logic into your API endpoints and stuff like that. I have six minutes. So I'm gonna see what's here. Uh, here we have mentions of like URI pattern. Um, 
whatever HTTP verb makes sense based on the action that you're trying to implement. We see post usually used for creates, um, post slash patch is it's, ne it's never a good idea to be honest to implement patching post in this design for updating. But then I have seen some constraints that uh, make you consider it rather than you're not really forced to do it, but then consider like implementing your updates in that respect um, just to maintain um, simplicity and then put um, for um, entirely updating uh, for ma making changes to an entire resource within the system. Um, this is a bunch of the same things where we mentioned resource types and how an actual mapping to a resource type helps you to understand which method makes sense for whatever step is uh, going on within the system or whatever step of the like CRUD flow or resource um, or product um, product requirement flow that is um, ongoing. So in any form of system, in any backend design, you will always have resources. Uh, you'll always have your data model. You can always um, create or understand actions based on a resources perspective. So having that down and thinking about that should help you decide how to encode your endpoints um, into stuff like that. As we finish off, trading domain knowledge with protocol complexity in systems. Um, this is basically saying uh, complexity, sorry, complexity in plants, trading domain knowledge, protocol complexity in plants. Having your interfaces contain some of those um, uh, areas of concern. Is, and this is, it's, it's, it's saying, when we look at the example that we just have here, which is our actions, um, our actions and resources helping us dictate or understand uh, whatever is going on within the system. If I had, if I knew what a resource is, and I, I knew what verb or endpoint or um, uh, suggest endpoint that has been designed for use, then it should allow me to, I, I can easily infer whatever is going on within the system. And that's basically the, the domain knowledge uh, for your specific area of concern, just encoded into protocol design. So not even complexity, more just more like design and how you just use this. Um, should allow you, and if your system doesn't help you or isn't at a place where you can come up with that, those conclusions based on the decisions you've made, based on um, the choices or the style pattern that has been implemented, then you can always consider ways of improvement. How can you refactor, reward, or um, entirely migrate uh, specific uh, endpoints or specific designs of your API to communicate or to allow you to communicate those uh, needs? Sorry, uh, high-level APIs of Akkad ones that replicate business logic into clients. Um, we've talked a lot about different things. Sadly, no code labs or anything. But then um, my pitch is, as we design APIs, designing them, high-level APIs is trying to refer to a good level of abstraction, um, implementing contracts, implementing versioning from the get-go, um, uh, implementing things like internationalization. There are features of your design that may not entirely play into your interface, um, uh, how your interface looks like. But then given that you've already abstracted or removed some of those business concerns into high level abstractions, sorry, into low level abstractions, and all you have are now high level interfaces that just communicate with those abstractions, allow you to really have a nice time writing your API. Um, CRUD ones that replicate business logic into clients. There's CRUD ones, CRUD APIs, of course, we're all building CRUD APIs most of the time. But then the idea is if you have most of those information, like the way you create information and the way you implement business logic is literally encoded into the different types of um, interfaces or endpoints that you expose, then that's a very, it's it's, it's a very expensive approach because just to communicate a certain thing that could be encoded or yeah, that could be encoded at the low level from a business perspective and just have a simple API abstraction that does the whole job, you may end up with multiple points of entry into your system, which you are just trying to um, check all the update to get a certain um, point across <laughs> to your system. So that's basically saying high level APIs means High level abstraction, high level um, API abstractions and interfaces, low level business logic abstractions um, uh, encoded into 
and exposing interfaces that are provided to your APIs then makes a happy developer and a happy API. That's my take. Um, no time to talk about hypermedia. I had initially had some slides around hypermedia and stuff like this. I'll skip this one up because I haven't mentioned anything about it. Um, protocol knowledge over domain knowledge. Um, the more we understand what the different um, terms within our protocols refer, our protocols refer to, um, then it allows us to um, it allows us to uh, create high level APIs, which means we understand what a high level API would look like. We understand the protocol and domain domain knowledge. You you can be better at protocol knowledge than domain knowledge because that means once you like put this uh, domain or business context specific information into your abstractions, then it becomes an area of the system where it's it's mostly for reference or for like changes that do not even have an impact on your protocols or your APIs that have basically been designed over the abstractions that the, like your domain uh, context exposes. Um, I hope I'm not blabbing. Test verified documentation over docs derived from study code analysis. This is again another point where we haven't really mentioned much, but um, I, I'm a big fan of documentation. Documentation is king for any and all forms of APIs. Um, I will try and collate a set of tools because I have used a few that literally are test verified or even test generated documentation. And it pushes you or maybe just forces you to say that uh, your tests can, your tests verifying whatever your documentation uh, says is an important piece of it. And if it can be as tightly coupled to tests over anything, then go for it versus having that within your static code analysis. Oh, and that's when we use things like, um, um they're called different things in different languages but this is like having just some some set of annotations or code over your methods and everything and again things like swagger do champion uh, these forms of patterns a lot but they don't really and uh, they are not really tied to your actual implementations as closely as things like tests would be tied to it so just saying that your tests should always communicate everything that you're communicating into documentation and nothing that you explain there is not tested. So tests and documentations are king. Embedded API docs and specs of a separate portal. This is a give or take opinion. Um, I would say it's better because the closer that your documentation and specifications are to the actual implementation, then the less chance of them ever diverting and growing apart. And this happens, yes, for when you're building public APIs for clients, if you're like that form of SaaS company or even internally as you're just building internally required documentation for your systems. Um, yeah, and I am out of time. It's 4.02. I have talked a lot. Do, do we have any questions? It's, it's, a, it's, it's been a long lecture, but just shows when you're designing APIs and you're designing just APIs, there's a lot of things to keep in mind. So you can maintain a balance of this makes sense, this level of abstraction uh, for this scenario drives me to make this decision for our API and say that this is a better approach to implement and this is a better level of abstraction to implement versus another. Um, yeah, um, and hopefully another day we can talk about this from like an actual code perspective and build an API that takes into account all of these considerations and see them in play and see uh, in practice in play with um, examples. So yeah, that's, that's all I have for today. Uh, and am I still with people? I... Yes, Chris, you are. I'm sorry for the lecture. <laughs> no, it wasn't a lecture. It was quite enlightening. That's so, what yeah. we came Thank for. You. <laughs> sorry? That's what we came for. <laughs> yes. So thank you, Chris, for an enlightening session on best practices of STPI. We appreciate having this mysterious area clarified. Thank you for the audience and anyone who spent the time for coming. It really meant much. This wouldn't have been possible without you. So
So yeah, the session has been quite memorable and the audience may be unaware, Chris, but we owe you a special vote of thanks for being here. We appreciate you taking your time and energy to grace this event. Once again, thank you. And Monica says thank you too. And yeah, I see if, if anyone wants to reach out, discuss some of things and point broad again. I'm not on Telegram, but I'm on the WhatsApp group. So let's use it. Let's let's talk. Let's um learn from each other. And yeah. And thank you for attending. So yeah. Cheers everybody. All right, thank you. Um Chris, do you have a little uh, a few more minutes just in case someone has any clarification they want? I am. Um, I can stay. All right. So um, we can open this for anyone who has a question to Chris about what he's just talked about. Um, so just before we ask the questions, if you are not there at the beginning, we talked about Elixir Kenya, which is a group of software developers from Kenya who have an interest in Elixir. They are either experienced or they are just interested in it. We have uh, there's the WhatsApp link. Uh, WhatsApp link provided by Paul on the chat. We also have a Telegram group. Every Monday we have a meeting from 1.30 o'clock to 2.30. It's one hour. Then the last Friday of every month, we've been having webinars where we, we request uh, for speakers who are interested. So if you're in here and you're interested in speaking, kindly reach out to us so that we can uh, organize so that you can speak. Um, Chantel, uh, the other speakers that we've had, the previous month was uh, Shoaib, if you remember. So this happens every last Friday of every last Friday of the month, and we've done this consistently for the past almost one year. So um, just in case you're interested in more, joining more of this, uh, it's every last Friday of the month. So we shifted the time from one. 30 p.m. to 3 o'clock just to take care of the international speakers so they don't have to wake up at 3 a.m. All right, so I open it up. If you have a question to... Thank you, Alfonso. If you have a question to Chris, just go ahead. Feel free to unmute and ask, or you can type in the chat. I'll read it out. Okay, so um, Chris, there's a question on the chat. What tools uh, do you know of or do you use that to achieve the standards you've just talked about? Yeah, um, especially talking of Elixir, even if Phoenix is already following the standard itself. Nice, I, I can definitely, this is one thing I can follow up with some more research, especially from an Elixir perspective. Um, some of this and more things to be considered, um, putting in to consideration. So uh, an example is when we talk about um, test-driven, test and spec-driven documentation, where you can encode some of these things, um, all your boundary layers and specifications and implementations um, into your code. Some of this I have used or seen in play in other like languages and frameworks, and I'd need to verify, for example, if they exist for some of these things. So let me, I, I, that's a strong one to follow up on um, with some set of resources and links, and we can definitely, like, as a community, help each other on that. Um, I do, let me see if there's anything specific that comes to mind. Uh, we've talked about uh, protocol knowledge, Lipermedia, media, high level APIs. Let me, uh, let me just follow up with a set of links and documentation. Um, I will, I can give examples for some of the things I've, for example, used, I, I mentioned I've been working a lot with Ruby very recently. Um, and there, there's a tool, RSpec. Uh, RSpec is a very common tool for Ruby, but there's RSpec, spec something. <laughs> yeah, but I use it on a daily and it's one of my favorite tools that just helps us come up with that perspective of encoding or even having your documentation and specs being generated from your test boundaries. So let's let's just put all of that in a link because I can 
I can try and rant about this and not come up with any um, information. But thanks for the question, Alfonso. And I promise to get back with more information on that. Um, I see uh, Mary okay. asking why do. Yeah. I can add something onto that. Um, if sure. Evans is on this call, um, Evans Okoth, there's a tool that he used to come up with documentation, if he can remember that. I don't know if he's here. I saw him come in. So you can just tell us about it. It was in Ruby, but we can find uh, probably an equivalent. I don't think he's uh, still here. We can get an equivalent in uh, Elixir. Uh, there's Swagger for Elixir that you can use for your documentation. And let's not forget our good friend Postman, who is uh, almost everyone's favorite at the moment. So you can also use that. They also have ways of um, just working around with APIs. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, for, thanks for that addition. Um, why do some APIs get duplicated? Um, this is, it's a broad question because again, some it depends entirely from the context of like the specific APIs in question. In in my experience, I've seen like uh, uh, like in companies I've worked for duplicating APIs due to concerns such as security, due to forward maintainability, whereby it makes more sense to maintain a certain standard going forward versus to try and rewrite uh, previous abstractions or previous interfaces to meet new requirements. So you find that as your business concerns evolve and as your application evolves, then in some scenarios, it doesn't make sense to maintain certain endpoints, certain designs, um, and certain actions that were previously available. So even as you're building your own APIs, um, if you're in a company that builds some form of maybe publicly deployed API for different other developers to consume, then when do you make that decision? Um, again, from a product perspective or from your scenario, you consider um, how that you consider the different ways in which uh, that API is being used and whether it makes sense. And this ties into what we talked about in terms of versioning and evolvability, where as your API and requirements evolve, then you get to a place where building a new version of your API is aka building a new service can carry this new um, form of logic or this new requirement that doesn't necessarily fall into place with the previous design. Um, and in some scenarios, you can, instead of duplicating existing APIs, build or duplicating existing endpoints and, uh, and uh, interfaces, build new ones to replace the scenarios that weren't really taken into account with the previous implementation. And then now have some migration strategy for maybe your users or your clients that doesn't necessarily involve an overhaul of your entire API design. So yeah. Um, I don't know if that's a helpful answer, maybe, but that's like some of the things that come into mind when I think about duplication of APIs and like advising people to move to newer standards and specifications. Awesome. Um, Kelvin talks about how to approach API testing. Um, test your boundary. <laughs> test your actions. Um, when you're testing when you have some form of, I guess we've all worked in uh, MVC kind of structures where we have our models, we have our views and even controllers. And then we now try to encode tests in those scenarios. Um, my personal rule of thumb is don't be too noisy with your tests. Don't try to unnecessary tests. Don't duplicate um, the same, um, the same uh, rules within your different tests and boundaries. As you're testing your modeling and your data modeling to be specific, then let your tests handle that area of concern and don't um, write unnecessary tests at your integrations level to test the same thing that is already tested in one area of your system. Um, as you test your things like APIs, it makes a lot of sense to always have, uh, you can call them end-to-end, -end, you can call them integration, you can call them, um, I'll just call them end-to-end, -end, which basically means it's from a client or user's perspective, does the entire flow communicate all the actions that need to be done um, to, to some extent. Um, I say to some extent because on one end, if some people opt to be as verbose as possible and end up rewriting their uh, integration and unit tests within their end-to-end -end tests, 
and some end up having um, side effects that are not really tested, uh, like are not really tested with your end-to-end -end tests. My advice on this is as you write your test and as you have your different boundaries, while the different boundaries, if the different boundaries have their own tests, then that is sufficient to expect a certain action to happen. For example, if you have a certain job that should have do a certain thing, that's um, uh, like initiated by an endpoint. Your endpoint is honestly only uh, concerned with whether the job was initiated from your end-to-end -end test perspective. And you're not really going into the nitty gritties of what action the job was doing because you should already have independent um, integration like tests for your jobs that already handle all the nitty gritties of if this job is called um, and it's running, then what exactly is it doing? What exactly um, are the data as it's touching? Um, does it have any extra side effects on other parts of the system? Are those implemented? So all of those are kind of held in one place such that they are no longer areas of concern for your end um, uh, scenarios, e.g. scenarios where you have multiple endpoints touching the same job or calling the same job, then you don't need to, in each of those integration, or sorry, in each of those end-to-end -end tests, check, so uh, like ensure that this, um, that this job is doing all the different, or handling all the different scenarios you expected it to handle, just because the tests, the integration tests for that job already expects all the different forms of data and are already trusted to work um, deal with, um, given all those different forms of data. So, I hope that's a helpful answer, Kelvin, for API testing and the job. Okay, uh, Santi Sana, Chris, I really enjoyed, uh, you've done a nice work on the slides, how they look like, you did a good job on presenting uh, and just bringing across your thought and just what you had in mind. So thank you very much, Chris. Uh, we hope to have you on another one. I heard you mention, uh, talk about we being able to do something practical on what you've just talked about. I can't wait for that. So uh, hopefully we'll see you again on this as a speaker. Thank you very much to Chris. Thank you very much to everyone else. Uh, thanks for having me and uh, see you guys next time. All right, see ya. Bye bye everyone. Bye. Mwani kuna ngoja ni Niliko na tuka kuongea na wewe Akisi mbibu imeli ya kutu ya kutu ya kutu Niliko na jua That's why zijatoka Siku badu ni wewe Oh, na record Niliko, please respond to my email